At age 25, she launched her furniture business. The now over 35 year old business runs itself without her input. But beyond her enterprise, this once restless Ibukun Awashika was a force to be reckoned with in business, mentorship, leadership, and boardroom politics. Today, we bring to you the inspiring journey of an athletic woman who even graces the silver screen. Welcome to this edition of Amazing Africans. I'm Susan Ilian. No mistake here. They're not teammates of the Nigerian under-18 female football team, the Flamingos. Instead, they are schoolgirls navigating the balance between academics and sports. Their focus extends beyond just football. Others find their hold more in sprint. Yet others excel in high jump, relay, basketball, table tennis, the list goes on. How time flies. Mrs. Ibukuna Washiko was once like these girls in her days as Bilkisu Abiodun Adekuna. Turn the hand of time back by some 40 years and you'll find young Bilkisu leaving dust behind her as she takes a clear lead in 100 meters, 200 meters, or even a relay race. This speed is what earned her the title Rabbit. Many years later, you can see her influence and strength reflected in the girls of the Methodist Girls High School, Yaba, Nigeria's oldest girls high school. She credits the school significantly for playing a role in her formative years. Very proud of my entire experience at Methodist Girls High School. We had, um, first it was a school that had uh, a lot of culture and a lot of values and sought in many ways to influence our mind in an all-round way. So you could be very, I was very active in sports. I was in the school's relay team from my second year in school. I was pretty fast, as my friends used to call me the rabbit. And I um, was very involved in school plays. And um, I used to debate to represent my school uh, in debates and all of that. So, so you had um, a full life. You could be all the other things to do were fun. And uh, we were mixed backgrounds. So it wasn't just an elitist school. It was um, girls from every kind of home, but we all got into the class because we were smart. And then, you, so you learned from each other. So it was a good community. I actually have a quote here. Seeing my drive as a young entrepreneur, my father used to say, I have given birth to this one. And if anything happened, he was always present to assist me, even if it meant selling his house to pay up any debts. He never discouraged you. And I'm sure that had great influence on what you felt you were capable of doing when you don't have to go against your parents. You have their full support. So I'm a daddy's girl, no doubt, and no apologies. I, um, in many ways, I think I had a special relationship with my dad. My siblings always say that. And um, he was a hard working man. You know, he believed in the value of working hard, but he was also a very simple man in, in, in many ways. My father, was in many ways the epitome of contentment. A man who worked hard, pursued his goals, but was happy with his estate in life. 
and didn't um, was comfortable to sit with the president and can sit the next day with the mechanic and have a gist and talk about it. When we were young, you if my father's driver was driving you to school or somewhere, you didn't have the right to say your driver, like my driver, because you would get asked, your driver? You don't have a driver. Your driver doesn't belong to you. And my dad would tell you, it's my driver. You know, you just have the privilege of being driven. My dad had, you know, one of the things that influenced my approach, because when I didn't understand when people asked me later in my 20s that, oh, you did something. Weren't you afraid it wasn't a thing that a girl could do? I didn't understand it because I grew up in a home where were mainly girls. My dad had mainly girls. Well, they had three boys in their lifetime and one passed. And so I have two brothers and we're five girls. So we were mainly girls. And my dad never told us there was something we couldn't do. Rather, it was about that we could do anything we wanted to. And we got all the support and encouragement to be able to do that. And my mother was really the same in many ways. She, having left her Cameroonian home at a very young age, she was literally about 18, and she ran away to marry the guy that they had met. I think my dad had gone on some man of war thing into Cameroon and uh, they met and uh, she was, she had been betrothed to another king or something. Her father was the king of their own community. And uh, she ran away, came to Nigeria. And um, they got married. My dad went to England to further his education. And my mom was pregnant with me. She'd had my brother. She was pregnant with me. I was waiting to have me when my dad left for school in England. And so she waited, had me. And uh, after, I think, barely a year, uh, they left my brother and myself with my grandmother and she went to join her husband in England. You've described your father as non-traditional um, in more than ways than one. He's also non-traditional when it comes to maybe even viewing women, would you say? In, in many, many ways. I, I had the liberty of expression. That's the word I would use. And I think that went for myself and all my siblings. We, we, my dad was strict in terms of values. He was strict in terms of, especially because we were mainly girls. But as he was strict in terms of making sure he kept us on the straight and narrow path, he was um, a very supportive, liberated parent in terms of our expression of ourselves. It's not only your parents who passed on some important life lessons. Your grandmother also has a significant role in your life, played a significant role in your life. Could you um, let us know how she also uh, lent herself to your trajectory and your success? Well, I, I, I think my grandmother had the most influence in nurturing my early years because my grandmother was responsible for me until my parents came back from England in the uh, end of 68, early 69, uh, by which time I was about six or seven years old, or thereabouts. So the, the, the really early years of my life were my grandmother's to nurture. And um, in fact, they used to call her by my name because she had only boys and I was the girl uh, she, she raised. And my grandmother was, um, she had a little cute shop in my family compound area in Ibado. My family is from Oyo State, from the capital of Oyo State in Ibado. And my grandmother used to sell salt. She had this little shop where she used to sell salt and little things. And I think maybe my first exposure to business in itself was sitting in my mother's, in my grandmother's little store and joyfully 
handing over products to customers. Mrs. Awashika may have found her foot in the furniture making industry in Nigeria. It was rather more coincidental than intended from the start, a situation she has continued to attribute to the hand of God. I thought I had things figured out. So, when you follow the trail, you will see just how much uh, the hand of God played in, in my life. You know, when I was in secondary school, first I thought I wanted to become a doctor. And then I found out that uh, medical school involved working with real dead bodies. And I quickly changed my mind. It was that simple for me. I just couldn't imagine myself playing around with dead bodies, so I gave up on being a doctor. Then I thought I wanted to be an architect. And uh, anyway, I ended up in university to study chemistry. But by the end of my first year in chemistry, I realized I didn't love it. I could pass sciences, but it wasn't a love for me. And I wasn't enjoying it. So I then thought, okay, first I thought, I'd like to be a lawyer because everybody thought I'd make a great lawyer because I used to debate so well. And I thought, okay, they might just be right. I remember going to sit outside the office of the Dean of Law every day for many days until his wife, oh no, not his wife, his secretary said to the man, look, you have to see this young lady. She's been coming here every day. And uh, this elderly professor is dead now and he asked me to come in and asked me what can i do for you young lady and i said sir i'd like to transfer to law next session the man looked at me and had a good laugh and thought i like your guts you know if i only take one person next session it will be you but you must pass very well i said yes sir however that would be my problem because once you pass very well my department will never release me to him. And if I didn't pass well enough, he wouldn't take me. So I had a catch-99 uh, situation. Anyway, I resolved the situation myself because by the end of the session, I changed my mind about wanting. That's why I laughed when you said I had it all figured out. I had changed my mind about wanting to be a lawyer. I now decided I would like to be a chartered accountant so I could go and work in a bank. After returning from the National Youth Service, where she'd been industrious, she needed something to kill time and a job to fulfill her everyday needs. Having developed a sense of independence, she remained steadfast in her main goal of working in a bank. During my youth call, I was a very rich copper because I was very busy. I was presenting a program on CTV in Kano. They had some commercial program that I used to present. I was doing voiceover on commercials. I was running an aerobics class for private clients because I was an athlete, uh, even up to my university level, you know, and all of that, so I could do all of that. So I was doing everything to occupy myself and I was making money doing that. So when, um, when I decided I didn't want to do the audit anymore, I came back home. And when I came back, I didn't want to sit down. I'd been making my own money and now I didn't want to go back to my parents to start asking for allowances or anything. So I wanted any job I could find first. So the first job I could get was in a furniture company, one week after I came back from youth school. Now, I just wanted something to kill time. I still had my eyes on going to work in the bank. And I only lasted three and a half months in that company. First, I realized whilst there, why I had thought about studying architecture, because all the creative part of my life, of me, came alive. And I realized I was in my element in terms of what I was doing there. But I didn't like the value system of the company and the way they did their business. Although the operations of the firm were not in agreement with her sense of values, nonetheless, there were lessons to take away. These lessons would become her mainstay 
and the fulcrum of her furniture making enterprise. I'd realized working there that, you know, when they hired the carpenters, they came with their tools, you know, and that machineries that were expensive, there were smaller versions of them. And three, you can rent the use of those machines without even buying them. And there are places where you go and do pay as you go for them to process things for you. So there were different factors of production available in this space. And all I had to do was to think of how to bring them together. With three carpenters, two sprayers, and two upholsters, that was the team she started with QB's Limited, a furniture manufacturing company back in 1989 when she was 25 years old. Prior to then, women were not a common sight in the furniture making business, much like many other trades and professions. Some considered it to be exclusively for men. With no initial capital, idea or knowledge, her restless determination provided the resources that would birth what later metamorphosized into the chair center. The metamorphosis has even grown into what is now the chair center group, which deals not just in furniture, but also in security systems, particularly Bankway Security System Services, with a bragging right of being the pioneers in Nigeria. After about 25 years in the business, Mrs. Awashika decides to transition it into a transgenerational enterprise, opting out of its day-to-day -day affairs. 31 going on 32, when I had my second child, I decided then that I would like to build the business to the highest possible level, but I wanted to have a life. And in wanting to have a life, I, I made up my mind that that business must be able to survive without me. And I wanted to do it in my lifetime and not when I'm dead. So I decided that by 50, I was going to be out of running my business every day. By 48, I had a firm come in and consolidate all my businesses as they were into the group and uh, then picked uh, people to manage the business in different levels. I have the title of uh, CEO right now. I just tell them, just refer to me as the founder because I really don't run the business. I have, there's a CEO who is really, who has the CEO responsibilities running the entire business and he will get his title soon enough. You know, and um, so for the past so many years now, I keep my eye on the business. I'm responsible. I'm focused on helping them in terms of trying to identify the right strategy and if we want to uh, get into new businesses but i've allowed the group to try and find his own way without me and i've always shunned any temptation to go back in because because you know what if you really want a business to outlive you it has to be able to live without you since the launch of QB's Limited in 1989, the furniture manufacturing company has evolved, taking on new names and forms as the Chair Center Limited and Sokoa Chair Center Limited. Now, more women have stepped onto the stage, making a significant impact and impressing greatly. They're taking a competitive chunk of the country's $5 billion furniture industry. Some of them are even now intentional about introducing more women into the art and business. I would say that you know that women are naturally nurturers. Naturally, we nurture. That's one of the things. That's how God has made us. We want to see something from scratch and then it grows. We're very patient too, unlike most men. So even from my experience, I used to train men. But I find that when they know how to do a little thing, they don't want to finish up. They are going to go and start. And so they enter into the market with that half knowledge. But you find that the girls are more patient because they know that they want to excel. They take their time to learn it and continue to learn it. And continue. They become better by the day. So you find that you find when, when people come in for training, after six months, you get that room. I have one here. People will come and disappear for three weeks and go and hustle because they want to make fast money. 
But the girls are calmer. And then they want to just come every day. Come be in a very, once the environment is conducive for them, they learn. And then I have a lot of also women that already have furniture businesses that are also coming back to learn. And then they just want to grow their business and excel and do it well. So they're not looking for fast money like the men, but they want something that they can nurture and grow and it can outlive them possibly. So I think that's why we have more successful furniture business owners as women now even than men. We're taking over the industry. With a net worth of over $18.6 million, going by the estimate of Forbes Africa as at 2012, 61-year-old Ibokonolua Abiodona Washika was worth over $18.6 million. But that's her monetary value, as she's definitely worth much more, especially when measured by the impact she's made as an author and motivational speaker. My name is Bilkisu. I was born and named Bilkisu. At a stage of my life, the Lord changed my name in my 20s as I became a Christian to Ibukunoloa. As a matter of fact, the promise came in English. It said blessing. So if you go to Fountain of Life Church, they will tend to call me Pastor Blessing. But blessing means Ibukun, and I don't like English names at all. So I was very quick to say, okay, if the Lord wants to call me Blessing, what is the meaning of blessing, Ibukun? End of story. That's how my name is Ibukun Aoshika. More popularly known as Ibukuna Washika, this serial entrepreneur served as the former chairman of the First Bank of Nigeria between September 7, 2015 and 2021, becoming the first woman to occupy that position. Before taking on that role, she had served at different times as chairman of the board of FBN Life Insurance Limited, FBN Capital and FBN Quest Merchant Bank Group. Her voice can never be lost in the crowd. Every opportunity will be given to you. Sometimes the world will not give you what you need, but if you know what you want, then you will learn to fight for what you need to be who you want to be. So life will not readily hand over things to you. Everything you will want for who you want to be is probably already in somebody else's hand. Her interest is unmistakable in social issues, particularly in women and making them the best of themselves, casting off the toga of unhealthy social beliefs. She's a co-founder and past chairperson of Women in Business and Management, WIMBIZ. You know, I'm very creative. Good for you. When you're designing the clothes, that's your creativity. Managing your fashion business is a totally different agenda. You must understand the fundamentals of the business. So where do you want to go? Are you running fashion for passion? Or are you running a business you want to build for the long term? Because that would determine if you think going to business school or getting certain knowledge is worth it. Another of her many firsts is as the first Nigerian to receive the prestigious International Women Entrepreneurial Challenge Award as a nominee of the U.S. Department of State back in 2008. Over six decades have seen her traverse life from her days in the chemistry lab to the years as chairman of boards. An advocate for women in 2020, she won the Forbes Women Africa Chairperson Award. She was named by Avance Media as one of the 100 most influential African women in 2023. She is also recognized by Reputation Poll International Limited as one of the 100 most reputable Africans in 2024, alongside other prominent African figures like Madame Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, Mo Ibrahim, Angelique Kijo, Mensa Otabil, Trevor Noah, and more. Mrs. Awashika, aside from being an entrepreneur, is a corporate board professional, a coach, a motivational speaker, and an author. How they set up. So I have a she hosts a TV program, Business His Way. Additionally, she serves as the chairman of the After School Graduate Development Center, a national career center in Lagos, Nigeria. 
At 61 years old, she commits to continue to give, hoping to have given her all by the time her time is up. I trust you enjoyed every bit of this episode of Amazing Africans. Please share with us your feedback and let us know some names of Africans worthy of celebration. You can interact with us using the addresses showing on your screen. I'm Susan Illion. See you next time with another amazing story. Thank you.